For the thousands of Americans, the sound of helicopter blades thrashing releases something in their psyches. For them, the old familiar chopping sound triggers memories of the war in Vietnam. The many who remember that small impoverished country on the other side of the world and what happened there still carry external and internal scars that will never go away. Now, decades removed from that experience, more and more American veterans of the war are going back to Vietnam. Some go back simply out of curiosity. Some go back hoping to put the old ghosts to rest. This is an account of one such veteran's return to Vietnam and his quest to reconcile the past and the present. What he found there was something far removed from the Vietnam of his youth. Yesterday I saw a flag She was flying up Looking kind of sad We got freedom But we got love America America Hello, my name is Greg Seibold and I'm a 45-year-old Vietnam veteran Many books have been written and stories have been told about Vietnam. With some help from a few of my friends, this documentary will let you better understand why a conflict like Vietnam can change personalities and attitudes. Like our fathers and our brothers before, now the children are fighting this war. In 1967, after dropping out of college, I volunteered for the draft. A few months later, I was in Vietnam. In March of 1993, a fellow veteran, John Kellenberger, and myself revisited Vietnam. This is my story. December 24th, 1967. Hi. Well, here it is. The first letter from Nam. Here's how I felt. We boarded our plane about 1 a.m. and flew to Hawaii. We left Hawaii and arrived in Guam in the Philippines about 10 hours later. From the Philippines, it was a two and a half hour flight and we arrived in Benoit in the 90th replacement area. We slept there that night and the next morning I got my orders to go to the 25th Infantry Detachment at Ku Chi. As we went through Saigon, it was quite a sight with all the people and it being so dirty. Anyway, we got here and started processing and going through the usual ordeals. I'm with the 2nd 34th Armory Division around Tay Nim, near the Cambodian border. Yeah, it's a hot spot. I don't know exactly what I'll be doing yet. Could be on a tank. I'll know in about a week. All night long, there's been shelling, and it's really loud. We're supposed to have a mortar attack tonight, but the all-clear was given. I guess I really won't know what this war is like until I get to my unit. I'm not really scared yet, but I imagine it will get hairy. Today we're filming at the High Ground Memorial in Nielsville, Wisconsin. It's a very beautiful place. Um, it's a dedication and a memorial to all the different services and service people that have served our country through the years. Um, Nielsville is about 120 miles uh, west of Oshkosh, where I'm from, and about 200 miles, I would say, uh, northwest of uh, Milwaukee, and about 100 and some miles uh, north of Madison, Wisconsin. Vietnam was an interesting place. Um, I, I ended up volunteering for the draft right after high school. In 1966, I graduated from uh, Oshkosh High School in Wisconsin, and I received a basketball scholarship uh, to a university down in Texas. After a couple of months, I dropped out of school. I came back to Wisconsin, went to college again, dropped out, 
and uh, decided it was about time I grew up, so I ended up volunteering for the draft. Six months late, later, I was in Vietnam, and uh, it was quite an experience. As I mentioned before, I was a medic with the 2nd 34th Armor, and we had operations uh, north of Saigon up to the Cambodian border. Uh, we worked the Iron Triangle, which is west of Highway 13, and also we worked, worked in the uh, uh, area where the Coochie Tunnel systems were uh, uh, in place, which is about 25 miles northwest of uh, Saigon. We're now approaching the, uh, the area that had the, the tunnel systems uh, just north of Coochie. Um, the person on the right here was a former ally of ours in the South Vietnamese Army and uh, was a major uh, in the Army for about 13 years. After 1975, when the Communists took over, he was imprisoned in the re-education camps for 11 years and has done everything since he's been released from selling pencils on the streets of Saigon to become an interpreter uh, with tourists such as we were when we were over there. The area that they're just showing here is the over 200 miles of tunnels uh, that crisscrossed an area north of Saigon. We're now in the tunnel systems. Um, on these, these tunnel systems were very elaborate underground. They had everything from uh, eating areas, living quarters, uh, of course, fighting positions, also hospital areas. And as you can see here, um, there's quite a bit of room. Some of these tunnels actually had chambers that would go two and three stories underground. And uh, it was actually very difficult for some of our bombs to penetrate. Here's some of the medical supplies that they had different storage areas. And they've also enlarged some of the tunnels so some of us Western visitors now can go through the tunnels. They were quite a bit smaller. Uh, I, I stand about six feet, six inches, and I'm about 250 pounds. And back in 68, it would have been very difficult for me to go through the tunnels. In 1969, Pat Forrester, a soldier with the 2nd 34th Armored Division, uh, took film of this base camp and tunnel system that they had discovered in the jungles of Vietnam. Usually you would find weapon caches, food sources, and other documents that would help us to determine what the Viet Cong were using. After we would find one of these base camps, you'd normally call in tunnel rats to do a more extensive search inside the tunnels. The reason, my, the reason for mine going back to uh, Vietnam is twofold. I went back as a, as a soldier wanting to see the country again, and I also went back to see if there's any business possibilities because I believe in the coming months, uh, this being the summer of 93, that eventually the United States is going to be lifting the trade embargo, and that's going to open up a lot of opportunities for a, a country that's been pretty isolated for the last 17 or 18 years. Um, I ended up uh, going back with a, a fellow soldier who I really didn't know but was in Vietnam the same time I was. Uh, we corresponded uh, over the phone for about two months and he had previously been back to Vietnam in November of, of 1992. Um, his name was John Kellenbarger out of Columbus, Ohio. And uh, we met in Taipei. Uh, we did some small talk in Taipei and then from the flight from Taipei into Ho Chi Minh City, which is formerly Saigon, we got to know each other quite well. And uh, eventually we stayed two weeks in, uh, in Vietnam. After arriving in Saigon, we stayed there for about a day, and uh, after that, uh, we hooked up with a travel agency, an in-country government-sponsored travel agency, um, filled out all of our permits, our travel permits that we had to have to let the government know where we were going to go in Vietnam and uh, when we were going to go to these places. Uh, that took about two hours, and after that, uh, we basically got on the road and started traveling. Our first day there, we went down to the, the Delta. I had never been to the Mekong Delta, uh, but we went to Mi Toh, and uh, again, a very interesting uh, experience. We went up the Mekong River, uh, kind of on a, on a tour fishing boat, saw a lot of interesting uh, uh, scenery, a lot of interesting people, and that was one of the areas in Vietnam where I got the feeling where there was still a little bit of resentment toward Americans. One of the few places in Vietnam that I did feel that, even though it wasn't very an, a very overwhelming uh, feeling. After uh, Mi Toh, we went back to Saigon, and we stayed in uh, or Ho Chi Minh City, and we stayed in Ho Chi Minh City that evening. Uh, an interesting thing happened uh, the first evening in Vietnam. Uh, my friend John had gone out. Uh, I had hit the sack kind of early, and he came back about 2 in the morning and woke me up and uh, mentioned that 
Uh, there was a, a bar that I have to come and see. It was just like in the old days when, when we were there 25 years ago. And in my first uh, trip, my first tour in Vietnam, I was only in, the, um, in Saigon for about two days. But at this particular time, we went, we went down to this bar, and the name of the bar was B-475. And what they were talking about was this was one of the original bars before 1975, before the communists took over. And it was interesting. Uh, we went in there about 2 o'clock in the morning, and the bar was uh, extremely crowded. There were Russians and, and Germans and Japanese and, of course, Americans and, and a lot of other business people uh, were having a good time in this bar. And to be quite honest, it, just, it was just like it was uh, 25 years ago. It's interesting when you, as a, as a 19 year old kid, when I went over there, I really was naive on, uh, on going to Vietnam and also what I was going to be getting into. Um, as far as being a medic on a tank, I really didn't, I really wasn't prepared for some of the things that I was going to be seeing or working on um, because over there, a lot of the things, you have 10 weeks training, but a lot of the things are just basic on the job. When somebody gets hurt, you take care of them as well as you can and you, we medevac them out. Um, during my year, I probably, on a tank, our tanks hit at least five mines. Um, most of our firefights were firefights where we got ambushed um, or booby-trapped, and then we got into firefights. And again, dealing in the Coochie, Coochie area and the Iron Triangle, there were a lot of uh, uh, hit and run, uh, just basic ambushes out of the spider holes where we really couldn't fight back uh, or see anybody that we're fighting against. As far as an experience for a young person, it's, it's uh, quite memorable in my mind. I, I think of Vietnam every day, whether I hear a helicopter uh, flying over or if I see something on TV such as Bosnia. Um, anytime somebody talks about war, you definitely have a reflection and you think back on Vietnam and your experience there. I don't necessarily think it's always flashbacks or it's always traumatic experience of thinking of Vietnam, but it's just something that once you're in a situation, whether it's Vietnam or Korea or World War II or World War I, you're going to have those thoughts whenever something like that comes about in your mind. It's just things that you will never, never forget. Back on this trip again in, in March of this year, uh, we also had the opportunity to go up to Hanoi. And uh, of course, during the war, we bombed Hanoi and Haiphong and Hailong Bay uh, extensively. And that was the one area I really didn't know what to expect uh, from the people. And there again, as soon as we landed at the airport, um, the people in Hanoi, which at the time was North Vietnam, were very friendly to us, um, were interested if the Americans were going to be coming back. And uh, it, it kind of caught me, caught me by surprise. While there, I had the opportunity to go to the Hanoi Hilton, was the, which was the infamous prisoner of war prison that they held and, and uh, tortured many of our uh, soldiers during the war. And uh, from my understanding, they're going to be tearing it down and actually putting up a, uh, a hotel of some sort. Um, Vietnam right now is in a rebuilding stage. Uh, the embargo has hurt them for the, for the past 17 years, but there are a lot of other countries um, that are going in there right now, signing contracts and, and really starting to develop the country. Uh, there were a lot of hotels going up. Um, a lot of uh, people were refurbishing old buildings, tearing them down, putting up office buildings. There were office centers. And um, it's, it's going through a change. And I, I believe, too, as soon as this embargo is lifted, uh, Vietnam is going to be one of the hottest spots in, in the Far East. Also with me are a couple of friends of mine that served in Vietnam approximately the same time I did. And they'd like to share a couple of their comments and experiences with us. Mike Will, a former Navy SEAL, served in Vietnam from approximately 1969 through 1971. What was it like being on a, a riverboat? It was, in a way, exciting and in a way, really scary. I mean, a lot, when you'd go out on patrol at night, you'd be going on the boat and you'd leave just at dark. And you'd be all fired up and exciting. And as it got darker and you got into skinnier, smaller rivers, everything started closing in on you. You'd almost get a case of claustrophobic. Sure. But then, uh, once you got off the boat into the jungle, you relaxed a little bit more, but knowing that you were on the boat and you were 
basically a prime target that there was no place for you to go when you got on the small rivers. It was pretty scary. <laughs> so I imagine with that type of situation, you guys probably got ambushed uh, quite a bit. Is that, is that several right? times? Okay, several times. I, I'm saying that because in a similar situation uh, that we're going to be talking about, you know, I was on a tank. We would get those same situations. We'd be going down a, a road, and if the road would close in too much, you'd really get scared just because you were so right. susceptible to an ambush, you know, exactly. like, like you guys were. Now, after you got off your boats, what kind of missions would you go on? A lot of uh, search, recon. We'd go in and just watch, which a lot of times I couldn't figure out why. We'd watch a whole company of NVA or whatever, VC, you know, plotting out their next day's events. We'd sit there and watch it. And I could never really understand that. I mean, you'd have to get permission to fire on them. But that's what the boys wanted, so. If you were watching, like, would you spend a whole day watching them or a couple uh, days? Or? A night. A night uh, watching. Yeah, we'd go out, sneak in on them, watch them, take notes on it, find out, you know, where they were on the map and everything. And a lot of times we'd call in air support, you know, sure. eliminate them, but. What was your uh, most memorable experience over there, if you could bring it up? Sniper duty. Well, what was that like? That was, I consider it almost, I mean, I, I go, I have a place that I bow hunt for deer, and it's pretty similar, real heavy foliage and everything. And I'll go out sometimes 3 o'clock in the morning to get on my deer stand, and I'll sit there for a couple hours in the dark, and my mind will start reminiscing. And it was actually a relaxing time because there's very seldom you you actually shot anybody you would sit there and you could reminisce about home you could write a letter you know because you were hidden really well you're in your best camouflage opportunity at the time uh, I I really enjoyed that I could say that I guess it was it was like me against a you know, hundred people or whatever nobody knew I was there I knew they were there mm -hmm. I felt safe how would you, so I, I take it you shot people, right. okay, would you all shoot singles? I mean, if there would be a hundred people there, would you pick one off or how would right. you? You'd, you'd be assigned more or less who you were supposed to take out. Okay. You know, they'd say that there's a NVA colonel or general or whatever is supposed to be coming down through here on such and such a time and day and you would wait and you pretty much know who the guy was. You okay. might take out one or two other guys with him, but. What, what type of weapon did you use for a sniper? M16. You used an M16? Yeah. Okay, with a scope? Yeah. What, what type of scope? Uh, Starlight. Okay, the Starlight yeah. scope. Okay. Okay. That'd be interesting. How far away were you usually from these people? It was from 150 to 200 yards. Okay. That'd be about the maximum you could see. How many different sniper missions did you go on? I'd say 15 to 20. 15 to 20. It's yeah. interesting. Any other situations over there that uh, bring back a lot of memories? Any particular firefights, uh, missions that went wrong uh, because of possibly a wrong order or uh, people messing up? Well, I remember one night that we were out and it was uh, really a black night. And we were just supposed to be on a river patrol, just set, tie up to shore in our, we had little sampans. They'd, pull us out in our bigger river boats and then we'd get our sand pans like duck skiffs they were basically go out and just tie up the shore someplace and anybody on the river after dark there was a curfew was suspected VC and you always had to call in well this one night it was really black and there was a lot of people coming down the river after dark and we called in and we got refusal to do anything about it we were supposed to let them go through which really upset us, and one of the guys got really upset, and he started shooting. Well, there was, we, we didn't know, it was a big company of NVA coming down, and there was lots of them, and uh, we ended up staying in this particular spot. We were supposed to be like four hours, nine hours later we got out, and there was two casualties that night. It was a, a Marine uh, Ranger, and uh, one of our SEALs took it. It was uh, that was probably one that really sticks in my mind. Uh, I do think about a lot. Was, uh, the order was brought down. I mean, we could have 
ambushed them, took a considerable amount out, and called in fire support, and we weren't allowed to. Did they ever give you a reason why you weren't allowed? No. Okay. You were given your orders to go and do this job, and you were ordered not to question it. Mm -hmm. We were an officer. Our officers probably knew. They never gave us the answer why. I could never understand why we always have to, this is supposed to be a war going on. Well, they called it police action. But when people are shooting each other, I consider it a war. Another friend with me today is Fred Hahn. Originally from New Jersey, Fred was an all-state football player, but decided to forego college and was drafted into the Army. He served near the DMZ with the 198th Light Infantry Brigade and also with the 1st Cav, an armored unit. Greg said I went to Vietnam uh, with the 198th Light Infantry Brigade, went over the whole brigade, so went over by boat. Uh, we landed in a place called Chu Lai. We then went down to a place called Duck Fo where we actually trained further. Since we're one complete unit, we had no real experience being in Vietnam. Normally when they send someone over, uh, they got indoctrinated by being with people that have been there for a while. Mm -hmm. We went over as one brigade, so we had to train a little bit longer, so in Duck Fo we, uh, we trained. I was with the 198th for about uh, four months, and then got transferred to the uh, First Armored Cavalry, which we then, our, our area of operation was from uh, Chu Lai, north to Da Nang and Wei in the, uh, in the lowlands, we'll call it. Not the lowlands, but the, the foothills, not really into the jungle. So it was extremely interesting, uh, making that transformation from being a grunt to being an armored. Okay, now I was in armored also, and looking at some of your slides, uh, one of the most interesting ones, uh, every once in a while we would have to work with, uh, with a cab unit, and they would have uh, um, some flamethrowers. Now, when people think of flamethrowers, most of the time they think of... Uh, an infantryman with a, uh, a couple of tanks on his back, and it's like a portable flamethrower. But in the armor division, flamethrowers are uh, usually on an APC, an armored personnel carrier. Tell me a little bit of what, what that's like to work. Well, we had a, uh, two flamethrower tracks that were with our unit. And I never really envied those guys, uh, because basically what would happen, if you hit a, a mine, your track would blow up. So I was always uh, wanted to make sure my track was uh, quite a few just, uh, tracks away from them. But we used them basically for burning some heavy brush out, or if we had some uh, Viet Cong or NVA uh, in some uh, tunnels, we would basically uh, shoot the, uh, it wasn't lit then, it was actually napalm, okay? Mm -hmm. They would shoot it into the hole, let it run down, then ignite it uh, to get their attention, uh, if you want to call it that, in the, uh, uh, down the cave or whatever. Uh, then they would eventually come out and we'd get them and shoot them. <clears throat> it was interesting work with them. Uh, you felt, I always felt uh, more secure being in armored versus being in the infantry. Uh, though you get killed just as quickly being in armored, you felt more secure having a tank or a track around you. Uh, Mike went out on some different missions, uh, you know, different type of missions, but I always felt uh, more secure being with the armored units. I felt the same way. Um, infantry, you know, they, they were the, they did the brunt of the of the, uh, the work over there, it seemed like, and uh, I always felt more secure having a tank just because, in a way, you have, uh, uh, you have so much firepower on there, and uh, once we would get in firefights, you lay down your, your concentration of fire, and it just, you, it just was a more secure feeling. So I think we were fortunate uh, in that respect, but again, we've both seen a lot of people uh, get hit on a tank or on an APC that got killed, but all in all, that uh, armor is pretty, pretty impressive when, you, when you're over there. The thing that amazed me is you wondered why you were there sometimes and what you were doing, I remember it was called search and destroy, and all of a sudden came, the terminology was search and clear. Uh, if you found a stash of rice, in the beginning you usually burnt the rice up or destroyed it somehow. Uh, and at the end it wasn't destroying the rice anymore. Uh, it wasn't, uh, if an animal had been killed, the peasants got paid for it. Uh, if you, with armored, if you went through a rice paddy and destroyed the rice paddy, they got paid for or fixed by the military for some reason. Uh, when you'd call in and ask to do something, uh, it was either positive or negative. Most of the time it was, no, you can't do it. Uh, had to scratch your head and wonder what the problem was. I think the basic uh, GI understood how messed up things were. 
but being just the GI, uh, enlisted man per se, uh, there wasn't much you could do about it. You just followed your orders and right. that was it, but you did wonder later on why you're doing certain things. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, you just say it was a, a needless, I'll call it a war, versus a police action. You know, it's, uh, it was, uh, you wonder about it. Uh, in some situations you felt sorry for the people, in other situations you didn't. It's been about 25 years now, and uh, as I said, until I, Greg and I started talking, but I didn't think much about it. Uh, I, in some ways, uh, am somewhat bitter about uh, the way we were treated. Uh, I, myself, we never ran any bad situations anywhere where uh, people came down on me, but uh, you couldn't talk about it. It wasn't a thing to be talked about, and maybe we didn't want to talk about it, but. Uh, you get together with other vets and no one said a word about it, you walked away. Uh, I'm glad people can start opening up now and uh, understanding it. Uh, at least that's the frustration that it's like venting your anger or frustrations 25 years. Uh, we are scarred. Uh, you all get scarred by combat. You start realizing it later on in life. Uh, I take a look at some of the decisions people made by going to Canada, doing other things, and I wonder, uh, maybe they were right, I don't know. Uh, I have two children. Uh, son and a daughter, if uh, the same situation happened and my son said he didn't want to fight, I'd honestly say since it wasn't really fighting for the United States that I'd probably tell him he could do what he wanted to do and feel good about it. Uh, but uh, it's gone, it's over. There are some scars, but uh, I'll just let it lie. In conclusion, I'd have to say that my return to Vietnam was very rewarding. It's answered a lot of questions that I may have had. It's also probably answered a lot of questions other servicemen will have if they go back and visit. Vietnam is a part of our history that most people would like to forget. But for thousands of young men and women who served our country when our country called, it's very difficult. It's also very difficult because we served our country, and our country was not very appreciative of the, of the things that we had done. I know Vietnam was a mistake. And I'm sure we've learned from it. Let's hope so. I'm proud I served my country, and I'm also proud of the service people that I served with in Vietnam, because I truly believe they were some of the finest servicemen our country has ever seen.